Testing, testing. There we go. Good to see you all this morning. God bless you. Somebody said there's two ways to face each day. You either say, good morning, Lord, or good Lord, it's morning. <laughs> so I don't know which way you did this morning, but we're glad you're here. Here live, or if you're watching this on the live feed, or if you watch this later, we're here to worship the Lord today. So let's pray and do that. Father, we're just thankful for this opportunity as a church family to gather together. Some of us here and some of us elsewhere, but we just thank you that we're all together in the Spirit. And we pray that through that Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God will worship you in spirit and in truth as we continue to trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, God. Hey, uh, you can stand up if you want to. Certainly. You know what I'm singing, it makes it easier for me. Whatever you need to do. We got a new one this morning. It's been on the radio for a little while. Hopefully you like it. I like it, it's pretty good. We'll see. Come let us worship our King. Come let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love 
Jesus Christ, my living hope. What a great line. I don't know if y'all noticed when Sam got done, he just he just took that guitar pick and just kind of flipped it up on top of that amp like, take that, devil. <laughs> I like You didn't think I noticed that, did you? I, he just flipped it up there like, there you go. I like that. Hey, we're in the book of Titus. As you know, Let's find it at this time. The book of Titus is leading us in becoming the church we ought to be. If you remember the backdrop, Titus, Paul's associate, a young man, he had won to Christ and discipled, and eventually this young man, along with others like Timothy and others, became part of Paul's ministry team, his associates. As we talked about last week in a message called Every Life a Plan of God, Titus was tough. He was a tough guy. And when Paul had a tough situation that he wasn't able to address personally, often Titus was the person that he sent into that. And there was no tougher assignment than this one. The churches of Crete. And we've talked about them. And they're in verse 5, and the Cretans are mentioned in verse 12. Crete was an island in the Mediterranean Sea, a Greek island. If you study the history of it, if you're into that, it's sort of a resort place, you know, sort of a, a sunshine and sea place where people would go and travel, and it was sort of that uh, kind of a Jimmy Buffett mentality, you know, Hakuna Matata going back to the Lion King and all that. Kind of one of those places. The churches in Crete were started by unknown people who were in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, and there were Cretans there. About 19 different groups, uh, countries were mentioned there in Acts chapter 2 when Peter preached that great sermon and 3,000 believed. And many of them stayed in Jerusalem, but many more of them went back to where they came from eventually. And so the Cretan churches had started well, but over about 30 years they had drifted. They'd lost their direction. They'd gotten off course. And the Cretan Christians had become more Cretan than Christian. And as a result, the Cretan churches had become more Cretan than Christian as well. And it's that old struggle for us, isn't it? How to be in the world but not of the world. There's always those pressures from the world around us, the, the people that surround us as we work, media pumps out images and, and voices and all sorts of things that can sort of shape us and, and make us become more like our surroundings. And of course, as believers, we're told to separate from the world, but not to isolate from the world. And it's always a struggle 
always a challenge. And these churches have not done well. I've often said it this way. If your boat's in the water, that's a good thing. But if the water's in your boat, that's a bad thing. And so if you got your boat in the water, you can sail. But if you got water in your boat, you're sunk. And these churches, which should have been more like the love boat, were really more like the Titanic. And so Titus' strategy there in verse 5 is twofold. The first thing he's going to do is he's going to ordain or appoint servant leaders. That's what we want to focus on this morning. And then they're going to teach chapter 2, verse 1, chapter 1, verse 9, sound doctrine. And then in chapter 2, the second part of this message next week, we'll look at the serving followers because it takes both servant leaders and serving followers to make any church the church it ought to be. And the bridge that both servant leaders and serving followers walk on together as they follow Jesus is good biblical teaching, the foundation. And so these churches had become very uh, wayward in their teaching, their doctrine, and as a result, they become very wanton in their living because what you believe determines how you behave. So Titus is going to focus on servant leadership, men of God teaching the word of God to the people of God, to the glory of God, so they can become the church that they ought to be. That's the idea behind this book. New Testament leadership is always servant leadership. Let me give you a working definition. A servant leader is a leader who serves the Lord by serving those who follow him. So a servant leader is called by God and set apart uh, by the church to lead Jesus' followers. They follow together. But somebody has to be leaders in uh, local churches. We're all followers of Jesus, but some of us are just sometimes put in a position of leadership. And of course, Timothy talks about this too. And many of the same qualifications we find for what we might call a pastor today is the same for deacons or elders as well. About the only difference is the fact that servant leaders in a pastoral position are called to teach. That's, that's probably the only thing that really sets them apart. We see a lot of leadership in the world. We see a lot of worldly leadership. We're in a political season, and we're seeing a lot of worldly examples of leadership. And worldly leadership is rarely godly leadership, and worldly leadership is never servant leadership. Jesus' idea of leaders is different than the world. Very, very different. You may remember, you might want to jot these down. There were three times during Jesus' life and ministry where the disciples were interested in leading, being in charge. Uh, greatness. Sometimes some versions talk about greatness. The first time, they just asked Jesus a question. They said, Jesus, who's the greatest in the kingdom? Of course, they were walking down the road, and you can imagine the disciples were sort of discussing this. Because here's Jesus, the Messiah. They believed him. They were following him. They were invested in him. They believed he was the king, and he was going to set up his kingdom. And there they were, his court, his staff, you know, right there. So they were talking about it. And one of them said, Lord, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? Do you remember Jesus' answer? He never said a word. He just stopped. And there must have been more people around or, or they're on the road. And he walked over and he got a little child. <laughs> Remember? And he sat down under the tree and he set the little boy on his lap, probably five or six years old. And he said, unless you become like a little child, you can't even enter the kingdom, let alone be the greatest. And of course, he, he wasn't talking about being simple or childish. He was talking about trust. Trust. 
The idea of greatness in God's kingdom is not about me trying to force my will on someone or get my agenda, but it's trusting God to do his thing and waiting upon him. So the first time the disciples ask about leadership and greatness, Jesus answered with a child. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> the second time, you remember this story, it was later on towards the tail end of his ministry. And James and John come and they bring their mama. <laughs> and James and John are holding on to mama's dress and mama does the talking. You remember this story? And she says to Jesus, Luke says she came worshiping him. You know, you can worship him, but you got your own agenda. <laughs> and so she comes to Jesus. She says, Jesus, grant that my two sons might sit on your right hand and your left hand when you come in your kingdom. You remember that story? They were arguing about it, and so Mama takes her two boys away from the other ten, and she says, would you put my two boys on the right hand and on the left hand? The big chairs. <laughs> the original stage mother. And Jesus said to the boys, are you able to drink the cup that I drink and to be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized? He wasn't talking about this kind of baptism. He was talking about suffering, trials, trouble. And they said, we're able. <laughs> and he said, yeah, you will drink from the cup that I drink, and you will be baptized with a baptism I will be baptized with. Remember, James was the first of the disciples to be martyred, and John was the last of the disciples to be living. They were baptized with his baptism they did drink from his cup. But then he said, to grant who's going to sit on my right hand, it's not mine to give. But my father in heaven. Mama was probably a little bit disappointed at that point. Scripture doesn't say. And it says the ten, the other disciples, were filled with indignation at the two. That's the world's greatness. I want to put myself in the big position. I want to be first in line. I want to get mine. I want to get the promotion. I want to get the place. I want to get the... That's worldly leadership, but that's not God's kind of leadership. Servant leadership is different. And then the third time, Scripture shows the disciples seeking to position themselves with what we call the Last Supper. Ah, oh, their bellies were full. They were reclining at the table. And Luke tells us they were actually arguing about who would be the greatest. And you remember Jesus' answer. Let me just read it to you, John 13. Supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing the Father had given all things into his hands, that he was come from God and he went to God, he rises from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Peter said, Lord, you're washing my feet? And Jesus said, what I do, you know not now but you shall know hereafter. And then later on, after he finished, he says, if I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you ought also to wash one another's feet, for I've given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Here's the key statement. Verily, verily, I say to you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. Neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. <laughs> so the first time they asked, he put a little child in the midst, just simplicity, trust. And the second time they, they came sort of demanding, he gave them an answer about suffering. And the third time when they came debating and disputing, he gave them a living example of servant leadership. And that's what we're looking at this morning here in Titus chapter 1. 
Servant leaders are those willing to become like a child, to be simple and trust God, to accept the challenge of trials and suffering, and to make the choice to wash one another's feet and to set the example for the followers of Jesus. We'll look at them in chapter 2 next week. But I just want you to get this. It takes servant leaders and serving followers walking on the bridge of God's word together to make any church, every church, all churches the church they ought to be. So the basic principles, although we pulled them from the first century, they still apply in the 21st century. Yet we see so many leaders in churches, religious organizations, trying to be dictators, trying to get their way, egomaniacal, trying to strong-arm people. And we see people in the pews, followers, trying to, to position themselves and, and figure things out and make themselves in the best position. And none of that is of God. God's will and God's way is based on God's word, and it's the way of servanthood. The way up is down in the kingdom of God. So let's look at two things here in chapter 1, verses 5 through 16. First of all, we're going to look at the character of servant leaders. And then secondly, the character of selfish leaders, because we have both today, unfortunately, in the church in general. First, let's look at the character of servant leaders. That's beginning in verse 5 through about verse, verse 9. Now, I say character because there's no job description in the Bible for a pastor, teacher, elder type person. You notice there in verse 5, he uses the word elders, ordain elders. It didn't mean ordain like we think in Baptist terms, having an ordination council and a service. But it means to set them apart. And then he uses in verse 7 the word bishop. I'm reading the King James Version. You may have a different version. But there are four terms in the New Testament that are used interchangeably for persons that we commonly call pastors today. One is pastors or shepherds. It's Ephesians 4, Acts chapter 20, some other places. Then we have this word elder, which is literally the word we get Presbyterian from. It's the word presbyteros in the Greek, if you're impressed. <laughs> But elders doesn't mean older people, but generally older men in the faith are more qualified to lead because they've got more life experience. They've been around their fellow believers longer. They're more trusted. People know who they are. So some churches even call leaders elders. There's a plurality of elders. Some Baptist churches are structured that way, some others. But that term, and then the word bishop in verse 7 is literally the word we get episcopal from. Episcopus, epi means upon like your epidermis, and scope to see, like a microscope or a telescope. And sometimes this word is translated overseers, or one who looks over the flock and the, the, the ministries or the business of the church, that sort of deal. But pastor, shepherd, elder, bishop, and even the word minister is usually translated deacon, but it, it, it can mean any kind of person who serves in the church. And we're not getting into Timothy, but Timothy uses these terms interchangeably. All I want you to know is different churches have different terms they use for people that are in positions of leadership. So I'll usually say pastor, because that's sort of, sort of our background. But other churches, maybe you have friends or family in other churches, they may use different terms. But the bottom line is whatever the guy's title is, and sometimes people call me reverend, which makes me feel really weird. <laughs> but I'll, I'll do a funeral for a family that I've never met before, and they'll say, oh, reverend, we're, you know, we're so thankful. You know, I, I don't know how to respond to that because I just don't even go by Brother Rob because I just feel like I'm a brother. I'm just part of the family. <laughs> That's the way I've always viewed myself. But some guys like their titles. You know, they like to be called the right reverend, doctor, bishop, apostle, so-and-so. You know, I mean, people, some guys like that kind of stuff. Not me, but some guys do. But whatever. So whatever the title, whatever the degrees, servant leader, the man of God that God calls to lead the people of God to be the church of God, that person leads by 
serving. That's the, the idea. So there's no job description here outside of teaching, like I said before, because each local church must determine what are the particular duties of the man they call to the position or positions if it's a multi-staff church like we call it today. So a church may advertise for a pastor and they may say job description, and that's good. But in the Bible, there is no job description. You see the genius of that? There's just a character description because it's all about who the man is before the man does anything. So if there was a job description here, we could look at this and say, well, he's got to do this for us and this for, and that doesn't work like that. So each local congregation on Crete, each local congregation in this community and all throughout the world will determine how they call a pastor, what his job description is, and then he can read that and think about that. But if he doesn't have the character mentioned here, it doesn't make any difference what the job description is. The character is important. The heart's at, at the very base of what a, a servant leader must be. So notice three areas here, verse 6 through 9, that are essential in the character of a servant leader. This is his relationship to God, his relationship to his family, and then his relationship to other people. That would be church people and people outside the church as well. Just general, how do you treat people? It's all relational. So on the one hand, it's about his relationships. And on the other hand, it's about the word of God. So his relationship to God is based on the word. He talks about that in verse 9, holding fast the faithful word as he's been taught, which means he's been discipled. He's not a young guy that doesn't know anything. He's, he's equipped preach and to teach and to counsel and to guide and do those things that God asks pastor guys to do. So his relationship with God is a given. He's born again. He believes in the doctrines of scripture. He's, he may be educated. You know, some guys have an education. Some guys don't. That's not a, a qualification. Now, some churches say we want a guy with a seminary degree, and that's okay. Some churches say that doesn't matter to us. That's, that's one of those non-essential things. But he, he's got some sense of the Bible and who God is. He's trusting the Holy Spirit to lead and guide and that type of thing. So his relationship to God is strong. It's current. He's not got excessive areas. And notice he uses twice, verse 6 and verse 7, this idea of being blameless. Verse 7, look at it with me. A bishop must be blameless as the steward of God. Now, blameless doesn't mean sinless. We're all disqualified at that point. The word blameless here is really an interesting word, and I don't want to just take it apart and put it back together for you. That's like watching paint dry for some people. But it literally means it won't stick. You know, somebody might say, Brother Rob's a real liar. Well, they can say that. But over time, people say, well, that's not that, that won't stick. So many times being blameless means not that people don't try to blame a person as a pastor person or try to uh, besmirch his reputation or, or cast dispersions on his character, but it doesn't stick. It won't hold up. That's what being blameless means. It doesn't mean sinless. And, you know, every church, every Christian has more than one preacher down through the years. Maybe some guys were better. Some guys weren't so good. But this is the idea of being blameless. That's his relationship as verse 7 says, a steward of God. Preacher guys, pastor guys, servant leaders are stewards, not owners. It's his church, his people. I told a, a friend of mine one time, all of us are only interims. We're only here for a little while. If Jesus tarries, there'll be a day when this church has another pastor or pastors. That's just the way it goes. So the man of God has to be blameless. That's his character, his reputation with God. Sometimes he may go through times when he's not. He can change, as we'll see a little bit later on in this chapter. But that's the general qualification. 
there. Then notice his relationship to his family. Verse 6 says he's the husband of one wife. What that word means in the original language is he's a one woman man. You know, Mac Davis died this week. It sounded like a song Mac Davis would write. Would write. He's a one woman man, you know. It means he's devoted to his wife. Now, there's some scholars that like to say maybe Titus and Paul were talking about polygamy here. Maybe there was some polygamous things, multiple wives. We don't know that for sure. I don't think so, but I read some of that. I think what this means is the man of God who's called by God to serve God's church ought to be the best husband in the church. That's what I think. I think a man in my position should strive constantly to do what Ephesians 5 says. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself. I think if I'm not that kind of man, then every man in this fellowship has an excuse not to be that kind of man. Now, I can be that kind of man and guys can find other excuses, but they're not going to use me for an excuse. And for 35 years, I gave my life for Sherry. And for the last five years, I've given my life for Allison, and I'll continue to do it. That's what I think this means. The husband of one wife. That if anything to do with polygamy or divorce and remarriage and all that kind of stuff, it means that the servant leader of God's church ought to be a demonstration of God's love for his church. That's what I think it means. I never read that in the book either. <laughs> That's what God's impressed upon my heart. Now, there are times that we fail, guys. But we ought to seek to give our lives for our wives every time we can, every way we can. And, man, that's a challenge. <laughs> so I encourage you to do that. And I hope I'm never a stumbling block to any of you men in that area. I always want to be an example of that. And then his relation to his children. He uses the idea of having faithful children, verse 6. That doesn't mean the kids are perfect either. But he says not accused of riot or unruly. And we're talking about uh, kids who, who just sin, who live in defiance. We know all children go through stages of rebellion or or disobedience. He's not talking about that. He's talking about the idea that the guy's got kids and he lets them run wild. You know, that's not a good example. So the guy who's a servant leader ought to love his wife with all he's got and discipline his kids and, and help them to know the Lord. That's, that's the general idea there. And again, this is the characteristics that Paul said Titus should be looking for in the churches of Crete. And then the last part of verse 7 and 8, the relationship to other people, both in the church and outside the church. Not self-willed or soon angry. Doesn't mean that we don't get angry sometimes as preachers. We're like anybody else, but not quick-tempered. And not flying off the handle. Not volcanic in our reaction to everything. Not given to wine. That is, you don't get drunk. And he talks about this in Timothy 2. I won't be given to wine because I don't drink any. But maybe there's guys in some persuasions, you know, some of these more liberal churches that think a glass of wine at dinner is good. I don't, but that's just me. I would never impress my particular persuasion on others. But I know the best way to never get drunk, don't drink. <laughs> Makes perfect sense to me. But I do have brothers in the ministry who think that a little glass of wine is okay. But I'm not me. No striker, that means he's not abusive, not slapping his kids around, slapping other people around, and not giving to filthy lucre or money. He's not in it for the money. We'll see that in just a minute. Of course, everybody that pastors needs a little money to uh, pay the bills and that type of thing. But there's some people who can get off on that and make money or package, compensation, make that the most important thing. It's not, but it is important, obviously. Then verse 8, he says, a lover of hospitality. That means he owns his home. Back then, they didn't have hotels and 
restaurants and places like that, and, and people spent more time in their homes. We used to spend more time in each other's homes too, a generation ago, and especially before the virus. Hopefully we can come back to some more of that because I think the homes are a great place for people to mix, mingle, be together, spend time together, that type of thing. But a pastor person needs to be willing to open his home up. And of course that means he, he needs a good pastress. <laughs> Who she, She'll be hospitable, and Allison is, of course, as many of you know that. But the idea of using your home to, uh, to be a place where people can feel welcomed and warmed and learn about the love of God. Lover of good men and sober, which means serious, doesn't mean non-alcoholic, means serious, just, holy, temperate, just some under self-control, some basic character qualities that would put men in a position to be servant leaders in God's church. And of course, those men would have to agree. The churches would have to approve them in some way. They didn't have votes like we do today, but they would have some way to say yes. And then they would begin the process, preaching, teaching, discipling, ministering, and becoming the church they ought to be. Now, why is this important? Well, not all servant leaders are servant leaders. Some are selfish leaders. Look at verse 9. He says to Titus, tell these guys to hold fast the faithful word that he may be able by sound doctrine to exhort and convince the gainsayers. Now, that gainsayer, that's an old King James word for those that contradict there, there are people in churches today and in the greater body of Christ at large who are not servant leaders, but selfish leaders. They are wolves in sheep's clothing. They are not feeding the flock. They are fleecing the flock. They are feeding off the flock. They are prophets for profit. And so one of the important ministries of any pastoral person is to know the word so that he can instruct people in the word so that people aren't led astray by those who use the word for their own purposes. And we see a lot of that today. Two reasons for that, and I'll get to that in just a minute. But look at the characteristics of these selfish leaders. Three things I want to throw out here. They all start with the letter M. <laughs> the 3M corporation here. <laughs> First of all, there's the word many. Look at verse 10. There are many. There's not just a few. I just wish there was one or two false teachers. False prophets. Selfish leaders. But man, they're all over the place. You see them in local churches. You see them on the television, the so-called Christian TV. You have cults, you have different things, you know, and there are just many, many, many. When Jesus was asked a question about the end times in Matthew 24, we think about, you know, wars and rumors of wars and plagues and pestilence and famine and all this kind of stuff. But five times in that discourse in Matthew 24, he says there's going to be deception, deception. Deception, deception, religious deception. And so these serving leaders are leaders who put themselves in positions of authority to manipulate people, to control people, to put people in a position, to put them in the position that they want to be in. It's not servant leading. A servant leader serves the Lord by serving those who follow the Lord. That's a servant leader. But a selfish leader finds ways that he can serve himself through other people. Can I just say something to you without getting in the flesh? <laughs> I hate that. I despise that. To see people who love God and want to follow God be manipulated by men who are in positions of power and authority. And the reason I hate it and despise it because our Lord hates it and despises it. 
When he came on the earth, he found the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the people who were in the position of religious persuasion and power, and yet they were using it for their own personal gain, their own egos, and he hates that. He wants us, guys like me, to be servant leaders so we can have serving followers so that we can become the church we ought to be. But there's many. Now notice what he says there in verse 10. He says, especially they of the circumcision. And what was going on back here at this time was there were Jewish teachers who were telling people, you've got to become Jewish before you can be Christian. So Paul, Barnabas, Timothy, Titus would come. They'd preach the grace of God. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And you believe in him. You repent of your sins. You're saved by grace through faith. And then these guys would come along. They always followed Paul and his bunch around. And they'd say, hey, I see you got a nice little group meeting here at home or open area or whatever. Yeah, Paul was here, Barnabas was here, Titus was here, and they preached and we believe it's great. Our sins are forgiven. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and then these guys would say, well, did they tell you about something from the law of Moses? Did they tell you about something from the sacrificial system? Did they tell you about Abraham and how he was circumcised and that's part of the covenant? Did they tell you about King David and his covenant? No, they didn't tell us that. Oh, they didn't. Oh, we're so sorry. Well, let us tell you because we know it all. And they bring these believers who, who love God and were living the life into bondage. You got to do this to be saved. You got to do this to be right. Oh, you got to do this too. And oh, you got to do that too. That's what he's referring to right there. These serving leaders who serve themselves by feeding off other people. The circumcision. And we have it today. We have people who are being brought into all kinds of bondage religiously. And it's only done to allow the leaders to be in a position of receiving what they desire. Quite, quite insidious. And then the second thing he says, the second M, not only are there many, but verse 11 says they're mouthy. <laughs> I mean, they're talking all the time. Blah, 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 blah. Look at all the words he uses about words. He says they're vain talkers, deceivers, verse 10. He says, their mouths must be stopped. I get this image of this giant mouth. <laughs> Talk about a big mouth. Just this, their mouths must be stopped. Then he says, they subvert, verse 11, entire houses. Their teaching gets down into the foundation of sound doctrine, and it begins to erode and eat away the sound doctrine that's been laid down and begins to unsettle whole houses. And so they're mouthy. Now, I've experienced this in starting churches. I've shared that sometimes uh, in years past, how there are people who are always seeking to draw attention to themselves, draw disciples to themselves, and they've always got to contradict, got an answer for everything. They can never submit and support and serve. They've always got to be in charge. They've always got to control. They've always got to manipulate. They've always got to get their way. And these are those kind of guys. And then the third M is money. No, notice they do it for verse 11, for filth, old, there's old filthy lucre again. So you see that there in verse 7, he says the servant leader's got, got to be uh, given to that. But the, the serving leader, the selfish leader, the self-serving leader, they're in it for the money. Show me the money. Bottom line. And that's a hallmark of these false teachers. Now, why is it possible? Well, Two things, I said I'd share them with you quickly. One, they're unsaved, of course. They're serving, self-serving leaders, sinful leaders, just looking to manipulate and profit. 
But look at verse 12. Some people like it that way. Some people don't want sound doctrine. Some people don't want to study the Bible. Some people don't want to repent of sin when the Bible says you've sinned. Some people don't want to obey God. Some people just want to play church. Some people just want a convenient religion. Some people desire a non-commitment commitment to Jesus Christ. And so one thing that we don't like to think about when we talk about selfish leaders, self-serving leaders, is some people allow it to happen. So they can be lazy and casual and sloppy with their Christian life. Look at verse 12. The Cretans had a reputation. They were liars, they were lazy, and they were loose in their morals. And so the selfish, self-serving leader, they won't teach the word. They won't counsel. They won't disciple. They won't develop. They just want the big paycheck. And the people lay back on the pew, lay back on the couch, and just do what they want. Both are involved. And increasingly in America, we want a religion of convenience, not a religion of commitment. And so just like the Cretan churches were becoming more Cretan than Christian, we have to watch that in our American churches, that we don't drift off into this easy believism and this lazy, loose living, anything goes. When Jesus has called us to follow him by taking up our cross daily, denying ourselves and following him, his uh, contract has not changed. He's very upfront about the cost of discipleship and following him. So he says in verse 13, this is true. <laughs> so Titus, rebuke them sharply to be sound in the faith, sound in the doctrine. And again, the servant leader is a person that preaches that sound doctrine and lives it out as best he can and serving followers or those who repent and believe and support that and they walk together on the bridge of God's word to make his church the church it ought to be. That's the idea. Then in verse 15 he says, to the pure all things are pure, to them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works, they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, unto every good work, reprobate. So in verse 16, the bottom line, there's a profession. They say one thing, but there's not a true practice. They don't do what they say they should do. So selfish leaders preach it, excuse me, servant leaders preach it and practice it, but selfish leaders don't. They don't preach and practice it. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> so where are you today? Are you a, a person who has trusted Jesus Christ and you seek to be a serving follower? We'll talk about that next time. He begins with the leaders. They need to be qualified in their character and their commitment to God's word and his church. And they need to be the example. But servant leaders can't make the church the church it ought to be by themselves. It takes serving followers as well. He'll talk about that in chapter 2. Are you a serving follower of Jesus today? Are you serving him? Is there something you need to do to change that? Something you need to repent of? Something you need to adjust? Or would you say right now, as best as I know, I'm serving the Lord as best as I know? That's the question as we come to this time of, of invitation and conclusion. Every head bowed and every eye closed for just a moment. Thank you for your attention this morning.
as best as you know, as your heart is open before God, are you ready to serve him? Are you serving him? Do you want to continue serving him? All those questions are the same question. Servant leaders serving followers. That's what it takes to make the church the church it ought to be. And if there's something that's hindering you today, something difficult, something that has caused you to sort of drift off course, you can ask God right now. You can tell him about it right now. In the stillness of this moment, Lord, help me to get back. I want to get back. Or maybe you're, you've been jostled this week and, and you don't want to get off track. Lord, keep me on a straight and narrow. Keep me where I need to be. As we move forward as a fellowship, as we move forward into the future, we want to become the church he wants us to be, the church we ought to be. We have to deal with these attitudes. We have to deal with these areas of our lives as the Holy Spirit, as only he can, as only he does, surfaces them, shows us, and gives us space to repent, to turn to him, to turn back to him, trust in him and to continue walking with him. The servant leaders, the serving followers, reaching people who need to know Jesus and becoming the church we ought to be. Now that's impossible if you don't know the Lord. So that's where it all begins. Saying yes to Jesus as Lord and Savior, receiving him, trusting him, and you can do that today, too, if you've never done that before. God's always welcoming us into his family because he loves us so much. The Bible says he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Let's stand together. We'll be dismissing back to front as we've done Priorly, I want to just say a word of thanks for those of you who prayed for Allison. You may have not heard her grandmother died yesterday in West Virginia as her grandfather had a couple of weeks ago. So I just wanted to say thank you very much for praying for her and her family. And uh, you may have heard and you may not have heard that Brother Raymond Baggett's wife, Diane, passed away yesterday. And uh, he was a former pastor of this church and a servant leader. Uh, and I'll be having her funeral on Thursday. So you may want to remember Brother Baggett. I'll be going to see him this afternoon and visit with him a little bit. Father, again, we thank you and praise you that we can be part of your church and we can help your church to become the church it ought to be as each one of us commits our lives to you afresh and anew. Help us to do that today as we're dismissed. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a good afternoon.